Namo Buddhaya, this is Abhinav Kulecha and I welcome you. In this video, I am sharing my learnings from the Middle Discourses 26 uh, uh, given by the Buddha, which is named the Noble Quest. You can read the full discourse uh, in the Sutta Center. Uh, you, the link is given in the description. Okay, now this discourse basically is the Buddha's, uh, in his own words, Buddha is sharing about his uh, story of you know, enlightenment as to, you know, the kind of uh, uh, the quest that arose in him and then he met the teachers, the two teachers and then he finally decided to, you know, meditate on his own and achieving enlightenment and then uh, going about sharing, you know, who he shared with. So let's read this discourse. Uh, uh, I'm like covering the main main points here of this. This is a long, like a kind of a long discourse which is around 11 pages, but I'll cover the main main things so that you get an idea as to what uh, is covered in this discourse. So uh, it is basically that uh, Buddha was staying uh, in near Savatthi in Anandhapindika mo monastery and uh, the, uh, uh, when uh, so mendicants, there were certain mendicants who went up to Ananda. Ananda was Buddha's uh, closest to kind of a disciple and cousin. So they went up to him and that, then said that, uh, uh, Reverend Ananda, I, we have not heard a kind of a Dhamma talk from a long time from the Buddha. It's good if we can he hear it. So Ananda said, okay, let's go to the uh, Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage and we let's see if Buddha gives a talk to us. So so that's fine. So when, when Buddha arrived, there were some mendicants were discussing something and Buddha kept quiet. So Buddha, despite being Buddha, he did not uh, interfere, he did not ask the mendicants to stop the discussion. He waited till their discussion on the Dhamma ended and then Buddha arrived and then Buddha said that uh, when he appreciated the mendicants who were discussing the Dhamma, that uh, it's appropriate for gentlemen like you who have gone forth in faith from the lay life to homelessness to sit together and talk about the teaching. When you are sitting together, you should te do one of the two things, discuss the teachings or keep noble silence, right? So two things uh, you, you should do. Either you discuss the teachings, the Dhamma, or you keep noble silence. And this is what Buddha always appreciated. And this is what, you know, the, sang, the work of the Sangha is that we come together, we meditate together, and we share the, discuss the Dhamma together. Uh, so in that regard, I will just say that I also do like this sessions uh, in the evening, every uh, Monday to Friday. Right now it's Monday to Friday. Uh, so uh, where it's like a live session where you can join by Zoom and uh, uh, you can join the Dhamma discussion and you, if you have any questions or any sharing from your practice, you can do that. So this is how we have, we all who are on, on the path of the Buddha, we will be motivated, remain motivated and continue on the path. Right. So Sangha is very, very important. So then uh, Buddha said that mendicants, now Buddha, Buddha gave a teaching here. Buddha said mendicants, there are two quests. Quests is, means the aim, right? The, the quest means like the, the aim, right? noble quest and the ignoble quest right so first buddha said buddha explained what is ignoble quest wrong kind of a not noble quest right buddha said it's when someone who is li themselves liable to be reborn seeks what is liable to be re reborn that means uh, themselves who are liable to be reborn like all of us right who have not extinguished their all karmas they will keep re reborn rebirthing till all the karmas ext extinguished but an ignoble quest is where the person who is liable to be reborn is also seeking things which are which are liable to be reborn seeking things which are liable to be reborn are all the things which are material things things which uh, basically which are impermanent which will die right and this is what gives us suffering we keep seeking things we keep seeking things which are impermanent that is what buddha said that this is the cause of suffering that you keep uh, uh, craving for happiness in things which themselves are impermanent and cannot give you happiness and this becomes the cause of your suffering in life right so uh, buddha so what is liable to be to be reborn basically things liable to be grow old fall sick die sorrow and become corrupted they seek what is also liable to these things right so we are all liable to grow old fall sick die sorrow and we keep you know hankering over uh, uh, other things like for example uh, man wanting a woman in a relationship and uh, that re that woman is also liable to grow old fall sick right so, so we have to stop chasing that those things so then buddha said what is noble quest noble quest is it's when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn understand the drawbacks of 
in being liable to be reborn. That means that person understands that this is suffering. I have been reborn several, several times and it has only given me suffering. So that understanding comes in that person. And Sikhs, which is free from rebirth. Sikhs, which is free from rebirth, means that the person doesn't seek anything which is you know, liable to be reborn, which is just giving momentary happiness. He seeks something which is not liable, which, which is free from rebirth. What is free from rebirth? Nirvana. That means once you are you get, obtain nirvana, then there is no rebirth. No, never again you are going to be rebirth. So that is what you start to see. You start seeking nirvana, which is all the Buddha's path. The Noble Eightfold Path is the same, the, the path that leads to nirvana. The Supreme Sanctuary from the Yoga, extinguishment. Extinguishment from all defilements, right? Becoming an Arahant. That is what our noble quest is, right? Okay. Then, uh, then Buddha said that mendicants, then Buddha now, now he's, so the good, good thing, great thing about Buddha is that he was very open about his own awakening journey, you know, that, you know, he is very open to his own vulnerabilities. Uh, in, in, there is one discourse that in middle discourses about the fear thing that he had, you know, in the forest when he was, so you don't, you don't get to hear from someone who is like proclaiming himself as a God that, you know, I am the everlasting God and not, so, all those people who have made Buddha our God, it's all BS, right? It's Buddha never claimed to be a God. He claimed to be have realized the path himself. And he said that I can I am a teacher, I can show you the way. Right? So uh, Buddha again in this discourse also, and I, this is coming in various discourses. Buddha talks about his time between his the time where he was not fully awakened, the kind of trials and tribulations that he had gone. So Buddha says Mendicants, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought. So Buddha is like confessing that I too was uh, seeking the things which are liable to be reborn. Then it occurred to me, why do I be liable to be reborn, grow old, fall sick, sorrow, die, become corrupted, seek that of that have the same nature, right? Why why should I do that? Why don't I seek something which is free from rebirth, old age, sickness, death, etc.? Right? So that kind of quest, that noble quest arose in Buddha's mind. And then he, sh he basically, uh, he so basically there were those four noble sites, the ill person, the sick person, you know, the dead person and the wandering ascetic that, you know, that arose this question in Buddha and then he walked on his path from his lay life to homelessness, right? And then Buddha talks about that he, when he was like searching, so he had heard about a teacher named Alara Kalama, right? That teacher was a teacher, a very famous teacher. So he went and he said that uh, I want to learn. So can you teach? So Alara like, yes, I can teach. And uh, Buddha learned very well. So he just, he, he shares that, uh, you know, he, he said that if Alara Kalama can, can uh, realize this teaching, what he's teaching, I can also realize. So he realized very quickly. He declared the dimension of nothingness. All that he he done and then and then finally so 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 Alara Kalama taught Buddha, Buddha to a particular extent oh oh which Buddha had quickly quickly learned so he was like a very good student but then it did not answer the Buddha's fundamental question as to how to get free from suffering that was the actually quest that Buddha had and so Alara said that uh, okay I can only teach that much now start Let's start leading the community together. But Buddha said, sorry. Buddha was very, very clear on his goal. Right? He did not like settle settle for less. That okay, you know, it would have been any other one. He would have said that, okay, you know, I have got a narrow big sangha. And uh, there's like this slight bit of arrogance or ego in a person would have with a thought that, okay, let me continue running a sangha. What I have to do with other things, finding the way and all. But Buddha was not like that. He said, no, my way is unfinished my quest is unfinished and uh, buddha said in this discourse there's this thing uh, then it occurred to me this teaching doesn't lead to disillusionment dispassion cessation peace insight awakening and extinguishment it only leads as far as rebirth in the dimension of nothingness realizing that the teacher was inadequate i left it this point away. now here now understand the context here when buddha left out left out on his search he wanted to find a way to end the suffering completely 
Now, what these teachers were actually teaching was they were teaching some very deep yogic kind of concentration. I will not say yogic. I'm not sure whether it's actually yogic or not because that word is not there in the discourse. But deep concentration based practices which could take the person in very, very deep realms of nothingness, neither perception, nor non-perception and all those things. But then Buddha realized that once my meditation is over and then I come back to the normal state only, right? So that was also a temporary state. So Buddha said that no, that doesn't serve my purpose. Then then that teaching is not for me, right? Because it, it does not end my suffering. Because after the meditation, if I am back in my current state, which is you know continuing this particular suffering, then then what is the use of this teaching? I have not went gone out of the samsara, right? So, uh, so Buddha then discovered another teacher, Udakka, son of Rama, and again the same thing happened. Udakka te- taught him, taught him, taught him to a to a uh, certain position, and then he said, "Come, Reverend, you now lead the community." So that also Buddha said, "No, uh, you know, it's not my goal to kind of lead the community and all. It's my goal is to find a way." And then, then Buddha left from there also, and then then uh, it's like said that I set out to discover what is skillful. Seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, traveling stage by stage in the Magadhan Islands, I arrived at Senani Gama at Urvila. There I saw a delightful park, a lovely grove with a flowing river that was clean and charming, with smooth banks, and nearby was a village for arms. Then Buddha said, this is the place I want to just meditate by myself and I want to, want to find out the way. Right? And uh, most probably that is this place of Bodhgaya in Bihar where Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi tree. And then and then Buddha finally got an enlightenment. Uh, it's given that knowledge and vision, vision arose in me. My freedom is unshakable. This is my last rebirth. Now there are no more future lives. Right? That Buddha is complete Buddha. No more future lives. Complete freedom. Right? Now, now, now Buddha is talking about the confusion that arose in him, in his mind. That, okay, I have achieved enlightenment with so much penis and so much hard work but sh- what I should do what I should do with this with this you know knowledge that I have gained so it is like I will, I'm just reading verbatim sorry it's being a becoming a kind of a large long video but uh, then it occurred to me this principle I have discovered is deep hard to see hard to understand peaceful sublime beyond the scope of logic but people like clinging they love and enjoy it it hurts it's hard for them to see this topic that is specific conditionality, dependent origination. It's also hard for them to see this topic. That is the stilling of all activities, letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, the fading away, cessation, extinguishment. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others might not understand me, which would be wearing and troublesome for me. So Buddha kind of uh, uh, understood this well before in time that you know what he is going to teach. People will not understand. And people have not understood today also. So today, today also people kind of, you know, uh, orchestrize him and, you know, uh, put him put him on a low pedestal and saying that Buddha is a false god and all those things, you know. So till today also, uh, Buddha people, you know, kind of uh, uh, demean him, right. And this, he, he understood even before teaching that people would do that because they do not, you know, they are not at that level, simply, plainly speaking. Then Buddha said that there are certain verses that Buddha occurred, it occurred to Buddha. I have struggled hard. Buddha said that for me also I have taken so much effort to understand and realize this knowledge. You know, how to explain it to people who, whose hearts are there and stuck in greed and hatred. I have struck, struggled hard to realize this enough with trying to explain it. Those mired in greed and hate can't really understand this teaching. It goes against the stream, subtle, deep and obscure and very fine. Those besotted by greed cannot see, for they are shrouded in a mask of darkness. This is like the realization of Buddha that, you know, who will understand my teaching? So then Buddha said, my mind inclined to remain passive, not to teaching the Dhamma. And, and so Buddha thought, why not, you know, might as well not teach the Dhamma. Then Brahma Sahampati, known, knowing what I was thinking, thought, alas, the world will be lost, the world will perish. For the mind of the realized one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha inclines to remain passive. So, they were like the shockwaves went to the higher realms. And maybe they were, you know, lot of 
uh, higher powers who, who were waiting that to, for Buddha to share his dhamma. And this was maybe some, some way predestined that Buddha will get enlightenment in this life after doing all the penance and all the you know, merit that he has accrued from all these lives. And now Buddha, being enlightened, says that I don't want to share the knowledge. So Brahma then come, came down, he appeared before the Buddha and, and said, Sir, let the blessed one seek, teach the Dhamma. Let the holy one teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes. They are in decline because they haven't heard the teaching. They will, there will be those who understand the teaching. So, this is a big, beautiful thing. Beings with little dust in their eyes. That means neither they are fully asleep, asleep, neither they are fully awakened. They have little dust in their eyes. So, they, Buddha, so basically Brahma said uh, that this is basically the kind of set of people who your teaching is for. So, please, please, please teach. Right? So, Brahma, so, then, then understanding but, uh, Brahma's invitation, Buddha surveyed the world with the eyes of, so he, then Buddha, what he did, he surveyed the world with the eyes of the Buddha because of his, comp because of his compassion for sentient beings. And I saw sentient beings with little dust in their eyes and I some with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties, with weak faculties, with good faculties, with bad faculties, easy to teach, hard to teach. Some of them lived seeing the danger in the fault to do with the next world, while others did not. It's like a pool with blue water lilies or pink. So Buddha actually came and realized that there are so many different different people, so many different different spiritual levels they have. Then, uh, then Buddha said, I replied to the words to Brahma Sampati. Flung open are the doors to the freedom from death. Let those with ears to hear commit to faith. Thinking it would be troublesome, Brahma, I did not teach. The sophisticated, sublime Dhamma among humans. So Buddha finally said that, okay, okay, those with the ears to hear, let them commit to faith. And I was first reclining, I was like uh, not teaching, reluctant to teach. But now, because this is very sublime Dhamma, but now I will teach. Then Brahma Sahambati, knowing that his request has been granted, he went away. And I, I, I just presume that he would have heaved like a, a sigh of relief that finally Buddha decided that okay, he will teach. Now then it is showing that who Buddha decided to teach first. Buddha, then I thought, who should I teach first of all? Who will quickly understand this teaching? Then it occurred to me. Now it occurred to Buddha in his mind that Alara Kalama, who is like very gastric, the teacher, the first teacher that he uh, went to. He said, why shouldn't I teach him? Right, that I have found the way. Let him teach. So then it then a deity came to him and said, Sir, Alara Kalama has passed away seven days. And the vision arose in him, Buddha, in Buddha, that he has passed away. So that was a great, so Buddha said, this is a great loss for Alara Kalama. Had he heard the teaching, he would have understood quickly. That's why friends, very, very important. And Buddha always said, death is fast approaching. Friends, death is fast approaching, right? Do not delay, right? We should not delay in practicing the Dhamma. Our death can come anytime. Right? So, if even if we are like a bit of Dhamma, we can read. We can read some suttas and these are now freely available. Thanks to big people like Bhiktu Suchato and their team in the Sutra Central team. They have made available everything. We have to just read the suttas. This thing we will carry in our future lives. This merit will help us continue the practice of Dhamma in our future lives. So, please make a daily routine to keep reading the Dhamma and keep doing meditation. Right? So that's the first thing. Alara Kalama passed away. So then, then, then Buddha said, okay, let me teach to Udakka. Udakka was the second teacher. Udakka also the, he passed away last night. So see the kind of a loss that was there. Uh, Alara Kalama also passed. Udakka also passed. Then Buddha said, then how, who should I read? Then he remembered his five friends. When he was practicing self-mortification, he was eating very less and there were five friends. Uh, then those five friends kind of abandoned him because then he started, he realized that there, sh there has to be a middle way. He should not do such extreme practices. So those five friends kind of abandoned him. And he said, okay, let me teach them. Right? So then it realized, he realized that he they are uh, uh, near Varanasi, at uh, uh, Varanasi Deer Park, uh, 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 Isipatana uh, near Varanasi. So he said, okay, then I will go there. So, right? So, so he replied to Upaka, I am the champion, the knower of all, unsullied in the midst of all things. 
I have given up all freedom, freed through the end of craving. Since I know for myself, whose follower should I be? I have no teacher. So Buddha said, I have no teacher. I have self-realized. There is no one like me in the world with its gods. I have no rival. For in this world, I am the perfected one. I am the supreme teacher. I alone am fully awakened, cooled and extinguished. I am going to the city of Kasi to roll forth the wheel of Dhamma. In this world that is so blind, I will beat the drum of freedom from death. Amazing. Like I am I'm getting goosebumps when I am when I'm just uh, reading this. And Buddha was like, you know, he was so kind of gentle and everything. But he was very so clear in proclaiming himself as the fully awakened one. Right? So he said that I am going to Varanasi to proclaim the Dhamma. So, so then, then he talks about that when he got, went to Varanasi, he saw, saw the group of five mendicants. The, they saw me coming off the distance and they said to each other, let's not interact with him. He had given up the kind of Dhamma and you know, he, he was not, he was eating food and all. But, but as they come, as Buddha come closer, the radiance that he was exhibiting, one person arranged a stool, the other person, you know, arranged some water and you know, everyone just bowed down to him. You know, it, they cannot not do that. And because there was something, hap- you know, there was something in him that was different. And then, uh, uh, so I said to them, Mendicants, don't address me by my name as Reverend. The realized one is perfected, fully awakened Buddha. Listen up, Mendicants. I have achieved freedom from death. I shall instruct you. I will teach you the Dhamma. By practicing as instructed, you will soon realize the supreme end of the spiritual path. In this very life, you have, you will live having achieved with your own insight the goal for which the gentlemen rightly go forth. So whatever is the purpose for going forth from lay life to homelessness, I will show you the way and you will become realized. Right? Then, then Buddha gave him the, gave them the teachings and uh, that is covered in actually SN and the, uh, I think the linked discourses, there's a, the, the first discourse, the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutra is covered in the SN, right? The, so that, uh, SN 56.11, right? So you can actually check it in Sutta Center. That is basically the discourse where Buddha talked about the Four Noble Truths and Noble Eightfold Path, the first discourse that was given in Sarna. So here, Buddha then talks about the five kinds of stimulation, sensual stimulation and all those things then four kinds of absorptions right all those things so that is it this is the this is the buddha uh, sutta where the kind of a uh, noble quest thing is there uh, now what is my lay, main learnings just to recap the whole thing uh, me i've just written my main learnings is one is continue on the noble quest right do not you know there will be several kind of obstacles that will come on this path of buddha right there will be demotivation, there will be restlessness, everything will be there. Just let's continue with our noble path of arahanship, the final goal of being totally free. Right? Second, have full confidence in Buddha. Have full confidence in He being the enlightened one and has and and having you know the, the shown the path to us. Third, feel fortunate that we have the Dhamma in front of us. We can practice the Dhamma. Right, our mind, our faculties are right that we can practice them. We have a clear path. You know how fortunate we are that Buddha had given us a clear, a noble, eightfold path. There is no ambiguity in his teaching. Right? Let's be fortunate. Uh, so be your own teacher. That is also one thing that I realized. Buddha went to different teachers, but finally he had for a, see Buddha. It's like I I read it somewhere. Uh, I think in the book Experience of Insight. That when Buddha got enlightenment, it solved his problem. It did not. It does not solve your problem. So you have to walk the way. You have to be your own teacher. You have to learn from your own experience. So we understand. We learn from a lot of teachers. We study the suttas. But Buddha's in complete teaching was direct experience. So you sit in meditation. You do vipassana, and you see the experience. You, you see the various kind of states arise in you, and they let them become your teacher, right? No Buddha can become your teacher. No, no one else. They can all be support. But your direct experience is your teacher and that will only generate the wisdom. 
right so let us be our own teacher in this practice share the dhamma like buddha share the dhamma out of the compassion for all beings let us all you know start sharing the dhamma in some way or the other right see if we can like share some bit of dhamma uh, on social media or something not impose anything on anyone not any asking anyone to you know come on the buddha's path no just keep sharing the dhamma because you never know that somewhere someone who need this uh, dhamma because of your sharing he can come on the path of the dhamma right and it can change his life okay uh, and then last is that death is fast approaching please always be aware that uh, death is fast approaching so let's b- bring some urgency in our practice let's not be like lazy if you can if you devote like half an hour to your meditation make it one hour if you devote one hour make it two hours right so be more kind of focused in your practice every day that we practice is very very important for us now we are on the path if we are not on the path then for those people it is not a problem you know but now we are on the path we and maybe if you are seeing this video till this time we have to be very very more diligent in our path right so so that is it i hope this video was useful to you and um, do share your reflections your thoughts in the comment section thank you so much for watching this video namo buddhaye namo buddhaye